Detroit. I always get that response. Um, welcome. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, hello, Detroit. Uh, this is a very exciting. I, uh, I don't do this. I've never moderated a discussion before. So I'm, you know, it's kind of new territory. So I prepared. I have note cards. I have questions. Um, I figured that I should be sort of, you know, I'm going to be the audience. I'm going to be sort of trying to channel the audience because most of us are, you know, have, more, have had more normal lives than you have, right? <laughs> I mean, I think it's, right? I'd say that, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just my, my job to be able to sort of like be sort of a reality check because, like, I mean, look, look, what, what, look what you've done. You've been president. You've been secretary of state. You've gone to Oxford, Georgetown, Yale... You uh, 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 many won the popular vote. That's true. And so, you know, I went to UCLA for seven months in 1983, and I hosted the Video Music Awards in 1998. That's about as close as I get. Um, so this is here, I'm here to be a facilitator and uh, ask questions. I think, you know, I'm very curious about your lives, your, 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 just your everyday life. We can talk about a lot of things tonight, but just like, what are you binging? <laughs> what are we binging? And do you binge? We do binge, yeah. We are, we are sort of reformed bingers. Um, but we are, you know, we, we save up on um, all of the shows and everything we want to watch. And then late at night, when we are both home and so tired we can barely lift our heads, we go, well, what do you want to watch? And so that's when we start to binge. And it is, um, you know, it's really satisfying, you know, because we watch all kinds of things. He has, he has shows that honestly... He is so devoted to, and he, I'll come down sometimes, you know, to get a glass of water after we've gone to bed, and he can't sleep, and he'll be up again watching these shows, and, you know, it's just a way of kind of removing ourselves from, you know, all the daily stuff. We've stopped watching the news, basically, so now we binge instead. <laughs> yeah. I binge the blacklist. Blind spot. I'm a typical guy, but I, I SEAL team. And we watch every episode of Madam Secretary, the most realistic. I was going to ask. Uh, in my opinion, it's the most realistic political show on television, or at least what used to be realistic <laughs> political show on television. And uh, right. then we watch some things contemporaneously. I'm watching this professional sports gambler break every record on uh, Jeopardy now. Hillary and I like Jeopardy, uh, but he's beating us every night. I don't know. You're watching the current, the current champ on Jeopardy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're pretty, you're obsessed with Jeopardy, aren't you? You love he, Jeopardy. He is. He is. Yeah. And, and, you know, he calls out the answers all the time. And, and, and is he right most of the time? Some of the time. Yeah, some of the time. <laughs> But we, we binged on your amazing um, serial about uh, the prison break in oh, upstate uh, New York. And, and it, it That's was, the reason I asked the question. No, well, I, I didn't know that. I, I really didn't know that, Ben, but it was incredible. You know, we, obviously we live in New York, so we followed this uh, prison break in 2015, right? 2015? Yes, 2015. You guys 2015. know the story? And, and it was in, it, it was out of a prison that's been there like 150 years, but it's called the Clinton Correctional. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that piqued our interest. And these, you know, these two guys were helped by a woman in the prison. Anyway, if you haven't seen it, um, can they still get it? Can they still find it? What? Yeah, you can get it. You can get it. It's, yeah, yeah. it's streaming. So just thank you very much for that. But, but, but I would like to just, just to key into that what you were saying about Jeopardy because you are 
you know, talking to you a little bit, he's very good with statistics and numbers. Now, you both have very big brains to do what you do, but he, I've noticed, like, you, you spout a lot of statistics. We were talking, coming here, right? I assume all of them were correct. I'm not going <laughs> to fact check you. But how, you really have an amazing, uh, do you have a photographic memory? A what? A, a photographic photo No. Yeah. No, and, but I grew up in a storytelling culture. You know, I, I'm the last president who will ever, I suppose, have grown up. I, I was 10 years old when, before we got a television. And nobody in my family could afford out-of-state vacations or anything like that. So all of our entertainment was storytelling. I was just reading a great new book, by, it's not new now, by Martin Puchner called The Story of the World about how our perceptions of other people and politics and culture and everything are shaped by the stories people tell. So I learned to listen because when I was a kid, I couldn't tell some interesting thing that happened to me when I was having dinner at my great uncle's, for example, which is my favorite group of storytellers, unless I could relate what somebody else had just said. So I learned to have a pretty good retention, but I don't have anything like a photographic memory, especially when I'm tired. I can't, I do remember your name, but it might fade before I'm done here. So you said you're not watching the news, but uh, I was reading your book, What Happened, which I think I, I would have retitled What the Hell Happened. Um, and you talk a little bit about your, you know, your morning routine that you will read the papers. You read the local paper in Chappaqua. You'll read the New York Times, New York Post. What, what is that experience like for, for you, for you two, to read the paper every day, being so much a part of the news? How do you, how do, you do that? Well, we, we invite you all into our kitchen uh, early in the morning. Uh, we still read newspapers. Um, we, I also, you know, and, and Bill does too, read online. But we, li we like and grew up with newspapers, and we, we like to see stories that we might not otherwise look for or notice online, and we like to see how they're placed in uh, the paper. So we put them on the island in our uh, kitchen and get our coffee and, you know, kind of begin to go through the day, and, you know, Bill will say, oh, my God, listen to this, and I'll say, I can't believe it. So we'll have this conversation at, you know, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's a real venting experience. Um, and then, you know, once we're done with that, we're done. You know, it's just like, okay, fine. You know, that's, that's what they say is happening today. And so as it relates to you in particular, though, when you'll read something about yourselves, are you able to dissociate? Because I know, like, I'm in a movie, and the movie comes out, there's a review in the paper, like, I don't want to read the review, I don't want to, I just want to, you know, that's my way of dealing with it. But you have to engage. Are you able to dissociate the public persona from your, per, from who you are as people? Well, we've had to, or we'd probably never get out of bed. Um, yeah, we've had to figure out what is real and what's not real. And I, I remember so many years ago, um, for the first time reading an article that I knew was absolutely untrue, this was I don't know, 35 years ago uh, in Arkansas. And I, I just, I was like, really? I can't believe that. Because I knew for a fact, because I'd actually been at the event that was being described. And from then on, I learned to take criticism seriously, but not personally. So if there was something to learn from it, you know, and there's a lot to learn. And if you're in the public eye, people are always saying things or offering uh, ideas, suggestions. So to try to take that in and take it seriously, but not to let it eat away at you. Because sometimes the people who are criticizing you can be actually very helpful um, by giving you insight you wouldn't otherwise have. But sometimes it is really intended to tear you down. Uh, so you have to learn how to balance that. It's not easy, and I won't say that I'm, you know, perfect at it, but we have, over many years, and unfortunately a lot of practice, figured out how to take it seriously, uh, but not personally. I think that's fair to say, don't you? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I have a different strategy than she does. I start with the cartoons and the puzzles. 
like the New York Post, you know, it's a Murdoch paper, and it's hard. they think they're going to Donald Trump when they die, and they uh, <laughs> and so what I do, I I learned from my mother-in-law, Hillary's mom, who forced herself. She was the most liberal person in our family. And she forced herself to watch an hour of Fox News every day. So she would, A, know what they were saying, and B, she disciplined herself to be able to think of a reasonable answer. So I don't mind reading that, but when I start, even with the New York Times, I read, the, I scan the headlines, and then I read the op-ed page, because there are Republicans and Democrats on the op-ed page, but they all live in the fact-based world. And the, so if somebody is being critical, they're normally saying what they, A, honestly believe, and B, have some evidence to back up, so you have to think of an argument to counter it. And the thing that's frustrating about today is it's so hard, given the information ecostructure, including all the stuff on social media, to know the difference in fact and fiction. And sometimes a lie works better than the truth. Because, the, you know, the, if you look at the evening news, they say our attention span for hearing one person talk on the evening news, even a president, is somewhere between eight and nine seconds. I hope it's nine because a butterfly has an attention span of nine seconds. <laughs> so I would hate to think we had fallen behind. <laughs> and uh, you're laughing, but it's a serious problem. Because if you, if everything is got to be quick, then people aren't three-dimensional people and human problems aren't three-dimensional problems. We just all turn into two-dimensional cartoons. And it's easier to dis uh, dehumanize people or dismiss them and you never learn anything. So I try to get myself in a good frame of mind before I read the news. And I find looking at the cartoons and doing the puzzles first it sort of gives me a shield of, you know, sanity. <laughs> Do you ever check out, uh, check out from reading the news at all? Like, just like, do you take a, will you have to take a weekend or a week off and say, I just don't want to? Yeah, we do. Yeah. And, and, and it, especially, you know, on social media, you know, to just check off, check out, pay no attention to it. Um, we can go a couple of days. Uh, then usually somebody will text me or email me or maybe call me and say, what do you think about this? And then I have to get back into it and figure out what I think about it. Um, but I, I, really, I, I really don't know what to do with this dilemma because, as Bill said, so much of what's out there now uh, is just patently wrong or false, and it doesn't... You know, it, it's hard for anybody, any of us, to try to sort through it all. And so you do need to take breaks from it because otherwise, you know, you're just, you know, your brain's just going to be on overload. You can't keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is. I think it's insane. It's crazy what's going on because no matter what your politics, it's just hard to understand what's real and what's true. And uh, I think about it, you know, with having children and how our kids... Uh, are experiencing the world, um, and uh, that never used to be a question, and it's it's definitely it's getting it's getting worse and worse. Uh, I wonder what, what what do you think the solution for that is? Well, I, I I don't know, but you mentioned kids, and there's a lot of concern now uh, about how participation on social media for kids and young people is actually altering their, uh, the way their brains work. And it's a form of addiction. Uh, and, you know, how do you um, encourage your child, uh, in our case now grandchildren, to be engaged in the world without getting sucked into what is an artificial construct of the world? Um, when people say they have friends they've never met, that, that's never happened in human nature in the history of the world. How can you have a friend you've never met? And so how your brain works now and how people relate to one another. And as I travel around the country, you know, go to colleges or universities, speak to um, faculty and administrators there, 
you know, they're really concerned because they have, you know, very bright, you know, very energetic young people who are often suffering from anxiety and even depression. And they can't figure out what's going on and they think about it, they have their experts look at it and they believe that it has something to do with this social media world that's been constructed. So I think we've got to come to grips with it. I, I don't know all the, I don't have any of the answers by any means, but I, I know that we've got to figure out better how to ask the questions and then see what we do uh, to try to you know, enable our kids to live in the world as it is today without being uh, damaged by it. Uh, did, uh, this may sound funny. I, I thought it was a real step forward when Twitter went from 140 to 280 characters. And uh, we're laughing, but I like Twitter. It gives me a chance to post a tribute to Dwayne Wade on his retirement or congratulate Hank Aaron, who's a very good friend of ours, on the 40th anniversary of breaking Babe Ruth's home worn record or, you know, that sort of stuff. But uh, w one of the things I try to do is follow our daughter because she's real active on Twitter. And she, uh, she gets sometimes in these heated debates, but she never talks down to people or tries to demean them or personally debase them. She resists the temptation to take the quick and easy shot. And I frankly, that's what I think is important. I think if we all spend our time finding each other unacceptable because our resentment is more authentic than your resentment, then we don't see people as we are, and it's very hard to have an honest conversation. So we're not going to get rid of the social media. It's very valuable, but we need to somehow see people as people and not look for opportunities to just zap people, you know, because it feels so good, you know. That's not good. That's not healthy. People talk to each other routinely in ways my mother would have whipped me for doing when I was a little boy. And I don't think it's cool. I don't think it proves, look, everybody's got something they can resent, legitimate resentment. But if you spend all your time just dumping on people because they're the object of your resentment, it won't make you happy. It won't empower you. It won't change somebody else's life for the better. And in the end, it'll bring you to the kind of politics that we have today where everybody's just objectified and it's bad. I agree. Um, it doesn't seem like it's going away though, right? Twitter's not going away, but I... May not be going away, but it can be tempered. In the 2018 elections, when the, our party won the House, and wait, wait, wait. There were a lot of close races, and we lost some very close races, and we won some very close races. But I think maybe it's because we had a crop of new candidates, uh, because the s slogan that allowed the current president to win the Electoral College, what have you got to lose? It wasn't make America great again. They knew. <laughs> More voters knew what they had to lose by 2020. And you had a bunch of serious candidates who were close to the their constituents and close to their issues, and they were reported in a very straightforward way. There was actually a lot of just unvarnished, unslanted, here's what's happening, isn't it interesting? And I think that, you know, the social media is not going away, but it may be harder to poison people the way they have in the past. It may, and we should all hope it is. And, and one of those people who won is with us tonight, uh, Congresswoman Haley Stevens, who, um, <laughs> ran a great race and, and, and focused relentlessly on the issues that people in her district cared about, uh, the manufacturing economy, how you try to, you know, reignite the uh, innovation and the entrepreneurial energy that is so present in Michigan and put it to work on, you know, building the future economy. And, you know, she did that. She had come out of uh, the Obama administration with that kind of vision and experience. And so she had something to offer to her constituents that wasn't just negativity. 
It wasn't just finger pointing and scapegoating. It actually was about let's get together and find some solutions to the problems that we face. Since we're in Detroit and some of you are in the audience, I also have to uh, compliment the city and the people for the remarkable things that Shinola has accomplished. And I've got my Shinola watch on tonight. I think I have bought and given away more Shinola watches than anybody in America probably. But I was so impressed when I saw the production lines and I saw uh, the woman running one of the production lines who'd just been a security guard in what was an empty building before they started. And we should make every effort to bring back manufacturing, but we should focus on things people will need for the future. And we should recognize why we can do it. We can do it because every year, labor is a smaller percentage of manufacturing costs and materials and transportation and power costs usually are bigger. So if we go to cheaper power, normally provided by solar and wind, and if we go to domestic labor because we got the biggest market, then we should be able to compete for a lot of manufacturing in the future. But we must also realize that the very reason we can get more manufacturing jobs is that manufacturing is the most productive sector of the economy. That is, every year fewer people can make more watches normally, or you name it. So that means sometimes if you hold your manufacturing job totals constant, your production will still go up, and it means you have to find other things that are related to it, like the they tell the Shinola Hotel and stuff like that. You know, these things are important. So we need a serious discussion about how to bring more jobs that pay well to places that feel left out and left behind. But you can't do it with slogans and smears. It's hard work. It, it, you know, when, when I was governor, when I came here running for president in 1992, my state was one of only eight that gained manufacturing jobs in the 1980s. When Hillary was a senator, she was, in effect, before Andrew Cuomo became governor, she was the de facto governor of upstate New York trying to figure out ways in these small rural towns they could add production jobs, manufacturing jobs, and agricultural jobs. And she did a really good job of it. But if you get into a yelling contest, people are blind to those facts, and all they're listening to is slogans and anger. That will not get the job done. It won't put a single person to work. You've got to actually do it. I want to shift gears for a second. I'm curious, just getting back to being you, you meet so many people. I mean, just even today, I saw the people that you met just being together for a couple hours. Um, for everybody who meets you, it's an unforgettable experience that they, they'll remember for the rest of their lives, they'll talk about it. Oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I met President Clinton, I met Secretary Clinton. They'll remember it. You guys, this happens to you hundreds of times, probably a day. How do you remember the people that you've met? Because you both remember the people. You've told me stories about people that you've met years and years ago. And how do you how do you take it all in? You know, I I think it is a real privilege to meet as many people as Bill and I have met over so many years. And it goes back to something he said. Everybody has a story, and everybody should be given the chance to tell their story. Now, it's hard to tell a story in a shaking hand encounter and a photo line or on a rope line, but you'd be surprised at how many people, even in those short encounters, say something that really makes an impression. You know, somebody who will say, you know, a personal story about how I, I met you uh, when I graduated from college and uh, you said this and I, I really listened to it and here's what I've done with it. You know, something that is linked to a prior experience. Or maybe, you know, I have an idea and I've, I've written it in this uh, letter to you, may I give it to you? 
and you'd be surprised how many really interesting ideas people are thinking about. Maybe it's related to their job, or maybe it's related to an issue they care about, or somebody they want to help and they, they need advice about how to do it. And, and in fact, you know, one of the big changes in running for office, even from the first time I ran, and certainly for the first time Bill ran so many years ago, is that those encounters would often give you information that you wouldn't otherwise get. So for example, when I was running uh, in 2016, at the very first stop that I made in Iowa and I was meeting people and talking to people, within the space of 30 minutes, I had half a dozen people talk to me about opioids. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, this is a really big problem. It was before there were headlines and all the statistics that are so dreadful about people overdosing and, and trying to fight their addiction. But, but people were telling me their stories. They were talking about their relatives and their friends. So when you want to help people, when you're trying in politics to make a difference, that's the, you know, that's the meat of the job. People are giving you the information that they want you to have so you can do a better job for them. And we really do remember that. We talk about it, you know, we'll come out of an event and Bill will say he met somebody who told him this and I'll say, you know, I met somebody who told me something else. And then you try to stay in touch, you try to help. I mean, somebody else who's here tonight is Mayor Weaver from Flint, Michigan, who has been struggling with, you know, a, 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 a terrible, terrible problem that should never have happened in our country, and yet it is still something that we haven't resolved. It is still something that uh, hasn't gotten the attention and the resources it needs. And I know, because I got to spend time with her, that she gets up every day and tries to think about how she's going to uh, make a difference. So it's because people trust their stories to us, Ben, that they believe that by telling us something that maybe we can help or maybe we can offer some advice, that that makes a big impression on us. But, <laughs> you and I were talking about this on the plane coming in, but starting on, it was really bad from 2014 on. Uh, I noticed that if you heard one person's story, and you talked about it and tried to do something about it, and that was seen as newsworthy, then people who felt frustrated and left out and left behind and looked down on, whose story weren't being told, they were mad at you. Even if you were out there talking about their story too. I remember when Hillary put out this, what I thought, dumb me being a policy wonk, I thought it was a great plan to generate more manufacturing and other activity in rural America and all these places that felt left behind. The counties that she won were producing 64% of America's GDP. The counties she lost, 36%. She understood they were frustrated. She was the only person in the primary or the general that actually had a plan to do something about it. And I was very frustrated. Wait, wait. I'm not criticizing her opponents, I'm pointing out that she was told that that was boring and it got no TV coverage. That's what her workers, you know, you're not bad-mouthing anybody, you're not hurting anybody, you're talking about all this stuff, you have to think about it for a minute or two instead of just eight seconds, and I'm sorry. That's what we got to overcome. Because then if you talk in slogans, that breaks through. So people who thought, Trade wasn't fair, for example. Like that wall deal, they said, oh, put up a wall, send the Mexican home, give them your job, send the Chinese products home, you can make it. Good luck, then we rewrote NAFTA and it's about what NAFTA was, right? So my point is we have to find a way to listen and talk to each other to figure out what the heck's going on. And the great thing about the 2018 congressional races is they were reported in a very straightforward fashion and there was no attempt to weigh in and turn them into shouting contests. And that's what po politics works better when it doesn't fit our emotional need for an eight-second hit 
and instead we reward people who are actually out there to listen to folks, understand the dimensions of the opioid crisis. For example, Hillary and I have, we know, five couples that are friends of ours who've lost their children. And, you know, that's worth more than sometimes if you're a politician than a college degree in public health. But it takes time to listen to those stories, tell the stories, and then draw conclusions about it. That's what you need. You know, I want us to not look back, and Hillary's always saying, look forward. What's this got to do with going forward? And what it's got to do is with this. How can we do better? And the only thing that really works is something that's people-based and other-oriented. And if you don't reward that in politics, you're not going to get very good results. We're talking about politics. Is there anybody that you guys, not to get into endorsements, but in terms of who's running and what you see happening, there's a lot of people out there. No, I think it's great that we have um, so many people running. I think it's a diverse uh, group of uh, candidates, and that, that will give... Uh, the opportunity for more people to get involved. Obviously, we're not, you know, get, going to get into it. Uh, we're going to let the candidates run their own races. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that they can each have their time, whether it's on the debate stage or in other uh, settings, you know, to tell people what they want to do. Because as, as Bill just said, you know, there were a lot of problems in 2016. We don't need to go into them except to try to understand what happened so it doesn't happen again. And part of that... It, part of that is for voters, for people, to take the elections back. You know, take them back from social media, from the bots and the trolls and the Russians and, you know, all the misleading ads and everything that uh, we had to contest with, take them back and stand up to those forces uh, and really demand that candidates tell you what they're going to do. And, and not just in a slogan, not just in a uh, you know, broad brush, but actually tell you what you're going to do so that you as a voter can make decisions that are you know, rational and uh, fact-based. I mean, obviously, the other side just absolutely lives off of negativity and attacks and insults and all the rest of it that we know. And, and the more people who say, I'm not going to fall for that, I'm not buying into that, the more likely we are to take our democracy back and actually have it function effectively on behalf of the people of our country. Um, speaking of that, um, I can't uh, not mention that uh, this guy Julian Assange is now uh, uh, out of the Ecuadorian embassy. W what's your feeling about that and him? About, what? Uh, about Julian Assange. About, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll start because I actually I'm have just heartbroken. strong feelings. Um, <laughs> um, and, and in part because I had to deal with what he did. And let's remember what he's charged with. Uh, he's not charged with disclosing information. I think some people are a little confused about that. He is charged with conspiring to hack into uh, a government, namely a military computer, uh, to assist uh, Chelsea Manning uh, in stealing uh, government uh, papers and then uh, publicizing them. So that's the, that's the count against him. Now let me tell you what that meant in real life because I was the Secretary of State. Because it wasn't only military information, it was a lot of State Department uh, information, a lot of memos and cables that our ambassador, uh, ambassadors around the world had been sending to the State Department for many years. And part of what you want an ambassador to do, and especially 
a lot of these are career ambassadors. They've been in the Foreign Service. They're very knowledgeable. Um, and they're supposed to share their observations so that we have a better idea of what's going on sort of behind the surface, behind the headlines. So a lot of these ambassadors wrote things that weren't all that flattering uh, about the uh, governments that they were uh, observing. I'll give you an example. We had a, an ambassador in Libya before uh, Gaddafi uh, was overthrown, and he wrote very accurately about a lot of the really uh, dangerous and threatening and crazy stuff that Gaddafi was doing. When that was made public, um, some of Gaddafi's uh, thugs uh, roughed him up. I had to take him out. But in addition to that, not just American personnel, we had names in those documents of people helping our soldiers, our diplomats, in, under very dangerous circumstances in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Iran, in all Russia, all kinds of places. So their names are exposed. Um, they're exposed as advocates of human rights, uh, democracy uh, protesters. And we had to quickly move to try to protect people who we thought would be punished, uh, thrown in prison, maybe worse, by their government. So there were a lot of very serious problems with just dumping all of this stuff, not redacting names, you know, just dumping it out there. But what really was most troubling is that that didn't seem to bother him at all. I remember reading um, an exchange that he had with reporters from the Guardian newspaper, which was one of the sites that was publishing um, all of this information, and they were concerned. They said, well, don't you think you should have redacted the names of these Afghans who were, you know, really trying to help our, uh, our people and the Afghan people stand up to the Taliban or the similarly in Iraq against, you know, some of the uh, terrible militias? He said, no, they shouldn't be helping the Americans. So this is not about the particular case because that will either be proven or not. But he is, in my view, a wholly owned subsidiary of Russian intelligence. He became a tool of the GRU, the military intelligence arm of the Russian government, because we know that he was given, you know, this great champion, as he calls himself, of uh, transparency. He was given information about Putin and the people around Putin straight out of the Kremlin. He, he never published it. He has been used willingly, I believe, uh, to uh, undermine uh, uh, our elections, um, our uh, functioning of our government. So uh, there's an indictment. You know, he is now um, under uh, request for extradition. We'll see what happens. Uh, but he may have started off, I don't know, he may have started off with a desire to make uh, government information uh, more publicly available, but he morphed into uh, a, an agent, uh, willingly or, or not, and I think it was willingly. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to see what else we find out, because clearly uh, what they did in the 2016 campaign uh, was a big advantage for, you know, the, uh, the Republicans uh, and uh, uh, the Russians who love them. So, you know, let's see what happens. All right. I think, yeah. I think he, he's going to play the villain in the new Bond movie. He looks like it, doesn't yes, he? Yes, he does. Well, you, you could do a good movie about that, Ben. <laughs> yeah, well, they, yeah, they, they, already, they did a movie. He's just a strange, yeah, just a strange character. Um, you were talking about being Secretary of State, and um, one of the things you did when you were Secretary of State was uh, capture and uh, take out Osama bin Laden. I was, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, I, I, I certainly didn't do it. That was, uh, <laughs> uh, that was an incredible operation, but I was involved in advising uh, the president about it. And, it, you know, it was one of the best examples of presidential decision-making uh, that I certainly have ever seen or read about uh, because of the way that President Obama... Uh, <laughs> You set the process up. There, were, uh, there was a small group of us, obviously the Secretary of Defense, the Vice President, uh, Chairman and uh, Deputy Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Director of the CIA. There was a small group of us who were asked to advise the President uh, and were briefed about the intelligence that uh, had been 
uh, compiled by the CIA that pointed to this house in Abbottabad, uh, Pakistan, a, an, a large compound uh, that was in the same uh, town, not far from the Pakistan Military Academy. And it drew attention, uh, and it began to be surveilled by our um, spy agencies to try to figure out what was going on, because there was some uh, evidence linking people who had once been associated with bin Laden to this uh, uh, building. As it went on, there was an effort to try to gather more and more uh, intelligence. But when we started meeting uh, in uh, March of uh, 2010, we, we didn't by any means have some document in front of us which said, well, you know, this is absolutely uh, clear that bin Laden is there and we need to act. It was, here's, here's the best intelligence we have, uh, analyze it and figure out uh, whether you think it's what's called actionable. Uh, and it was, it was not uh, an easy decision, and people disagreed. The very smart, very dedicated uh, people who, with a lot of experience, looked at it and said, you know, I don't think there's enough there. And we, we went on. We met and met and met, and it was top secret. We couldn't tell anybody. Uh, and eventually, uh, we had to make a recommendation to the president. And there were people who said, we just don't think we should do anything. There were people who said, you know, maybe there's something there, but we don't want to risk our uh, special forces, so we could, you know, take it out with a Predator drone or, or a, a guided missile. Um, and then there were those who said, no, we should send in uh, a SEAL team to uh, do the raid and figure out whether it is uh, bin Laden. Now... After listening to this, and, and obviously I brought to this discussion the fact that I was a senator from New York on 9-11, and I had spent you know, much of my Senate years uh, working to rebuild New York, working to help uh, the families of victims, working to help those who were injured, working to rebuild the businesses that had been destroyed. So I was someone who thought that we should never give up the hunt for bin Laden, and if we had uh, good enough evidence, we should act. And so uh, when it came time for me to uh, make my recommendation to the president, I said that I thought we should uh, launch a raid. Uh, now, the best part of this was the people in charge, uh, like Admiral McRaven, who was at that time, the head of special forces, were well aware of everything that could go wrong, and they were planning every single contingency. Because we had a terrible, terrible incident when Jimmy Carter tried to rescue hostages uh, in Iran, and the, and the helicopters crashed in the desert because of the, uh, the, the sandstorm that came up. And everybody studied all that had happened and tried to figure out, okay, what, what do we do to plan every contingency? So... The decision went to the president, and, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not a hard decision, it's not going to get to the president. The hardest decisions are supposed to get to the president. They're supposed to be decided in a process like the one that uh, was run here, not on Twitter, but actually listening to people who bring um, information and experience to the table. So the, the president took it all on board and decided that uh, there would be a raid. So the famous pictures of that day are in this small situation room off of the large one uh, in the White House. And those of us who'd been part of the decision making were in the room. And we could see the beginning of the raid because we first had overhead uh, cameras and then we had cameras on the helmets of uh, the SEALs. Uh, and the, the most heart-stopping moment was when uh, one of the helicopters' tail uh, hit the, uh, the wall going over into a courtyard where the SEALs were going to get out. And, you know, we, we were just, you know, hearts in our mouths trying to figure out, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? But we knew there was contingencies. We knew there, were, uh, there was another helicopter that could come in. Once the SEALs went into the house, we didn't see anything, and then we got word that there'd been a firefight and that uh, bin Laden uh, had been killed. And, and here's the thing, the story that I want to end with, because this is often not included in the, in the movies and the books and everything that's been written, but which was really incredibly uh, important to me. So before they could leave, the SEALs had to blow up 
the disabled helicopter. It had a lot of advanced equipment. They didn't want it to fall into the hands of the Pakistanis or the Pakistanis, you know, basically to give it to the Chinese, the Russians, or somebody else. Uh, so they had to blow it up. And when you're going to blow up uh, an advanced piece of equipment, you know, you can't predict, you know, what the bomb blast area is going to be, what's going to happen, how far the shrapnel from the uh, copter is going to go. So our SEALs took the time. People are waking up. We know they're waking up. We're getting intelligence. They're on their roofs. They're wondering what's going on. Um, our, our SEALs took the time to take the women and children, the wives of bin Laden and his cohorts and their children, out of the compound, around the far side, so that they wouldn't be injured by the blast. And, you know, when people criticize us, which is fair game, you know, we're, we're a big country, we can, we can take the criticism and we should learn from it. I think about those SEALs risking their lives to take those women and children out so that they wouldn't be injured when they blew up that copter before they got out of uh, that dangerous situation. And it was uh, an amazing uh, achievement. Uh, one light note about this. First of all, I agree with the decision, and I agreed with it at the time, and I think I want to say something about how it was made, but as soon as it happened, as soon as President Obama got confirmation, he placed quick calls to President George W. Bush and me because he knew we'd both been involved in the hunt for bin Laden. So he, he calls me and he says, well, we got him. And I said, who? <laughs> and he said, Hillary didn't tell you? I said, Mr. President. He said, bin Laden, Hillary didn't tell you? I said, Mr. President, you told her not to tell anybody, didn't you? He said, well, sure, but I said, she didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and I tell you this because I want to, I was really proud of her, but because there was nothing I could do or contribute, I thought it was a, absolutely the right decision. But what I want you to remember about the story she told is that should apply generally to presidential decision makings, and it has relevance to wherever you work with whomever you work. Why? Because you don't want a bunch of yes men and women around you. You want people who have, you want people who have different experiences and different knowledge. I could fill the beautiful Fox Theater with the studies that prove that diverse groups make better decisions than homogenous groups are lone geniuses even. And to make this work, President Obama needed a team of people who A, knew what they were talking about, B, felt free to speak their mind, and C, knew that whether they said do it or don't, they would not be isolated, ostracized, outed, embarrassed, demoted, run away that you had this end up. I think that's very important. I, I told all the young people working for me the first few days we were in the White House, I said, if anybody ever comes into this office and tells me what they have decided they think I want to hear, we might as well run the place with a computer. And so this, this is an example of the kinds of decisions, in my opinion, that make for success in virtually any endeavor, but you should really want it in the White House. So you were telling me that you've been to every high school reunion, uh, right, of your high school class, almost every high school reunion. Ex your high school reunion. Right, almost everyone except, you said in, it was like 1999 because you yeah. had to save Kosovo. I've been to, um, <laughs> since 1964. Oh, my God. This is my 55th high school reunion this summer. I have been... To every five years I've gone to my high school reunion, except 1999, because we were about to attack Serbia to keep Kosovo from going through the ethnic cleansing that Bosnia had been through. And it was very important. But I still, on the Sunday, got together with some of my better off classmates who were willing to charter a plane and bring a lot of my classmates and their families 
to the White House for a mini reunion. It was great. Well, so that, you know, just getting back to your not normal lives. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want, we had normal lives. <laughs> no, but, but here's the thing. You, I, I wanted to ask you just in relation to the uh, Bin Laden thing. What was the toughest... What was the toughest decision you ever had to make as president? <clears throat> well, I think all the decisions that I knew would cost people their lives, and sometimes totally innocent people. I have no doubt I did the right thing in Kosovo, but one of the targets we had was a bridge being used by the Serbian military forces. And I was assured, uh, we talked about it every day for 77 days. And they said, we got to hit this bridge, and there won't be any Kosovo Albanians on this bridge. They don't use it because they know it's been taken over by the Serbians. So we took the bridge out, and a bus full of 68 Albanians we were trying to help. When uh, Saddam Hussein tried to kill George Bush, the elder, Bush 41, with a bomb that was so, it, it was uh, the most ineptly kept secret in my lifetime. The bomb might as well have said, made in Baghdad by the Ministry of the Interior. And thank God it didn't kill him. But I was livid. And, you know, I know George Bush and I ran against each other, and all of you know we later became very close friends, and I treasure the friendship I had with him more than I can say. But. At the time, he was a former president who was the youngest person shot out of an airplane in World War II. And here's this guy trying to kill him because he stopped him from taking over Kuwait. So I wanted to really zap him. Colin Powell said, we have to have a proportionate response because you don't want to own Iraq because Iraq is a complicated place and we got him just where we want him and I kept him there, that is, in a box and we protected the Kurds and we did the best we could. So we had missiles that were highly accurate and we decided we would take out a lot of the interior ministry and we do it in the middle of the night so there wouldn't be a lot of civilians there. We decided what we wanted to do is scare the living daylights out of them, not kill a bunch of people. But three of those missiles overshot, accurate as they were, and landed in a Baghdad neighborhood and killed eight people. And for all I know, all eight of them hated Saddam Hussein. So anytime, uh, you know, you think you can play war games without collateral damage, you're wrong. So I tried to do things that would minimize the loss of life among Americans and minimize the loss of life of innocent, non-involved people. Those were hard decisions. The controversial decisions I made in America, most of them were pretty easy. 80% uh, of the people were against my giving an emergency loan to Mexico. But if you think the border's now, bad now, if I hadn't given that loan, it would have been worse earlier and they paid the loan back three years earlier, and we made $600 million more for you than we would have if we'd left the money in the bank. So uh, sometimes making unpopular decisions weren't the hard ones. The, the hard ones were the ones that were where people were involved. I hated it when we reversed trickle-down economics and replaced it with you know, what I call invest and grow. You grow the economy from the middle out and the bottom up. Thanks no, in no small part to a Michigan native, Gene Sperling, who was my economic advisor. Um, I knew it would be unpopular, but I felt bad about it. I signed the assault weapons ban and the ammunition clip limit. And... Uh, uh, And it was hard for me because I knew that members of the House would lose their jobs over it. And I woke up in a cold sweat for years thinking about all those really able members of Congress. Now, we had the lowest crime rate in 25 years, the lowest murder rate in 33 years, the lowest illegal death by guns in 46 years. 
I'm glad we did it, but I still felt sick because I knew those people had to run in 1994 and that I didn't have to run till 96. And by 96, everybody would see the claims they were making against me that I was going to take your gun, interfere with hunting, sports shooting, defending your family were a load of bull. But then when it expired in 2005, we could never get it back because they made the same claims again to a whole new class of people who did not have the experience of going through it before. And we ought to do it again, I think. Was it fun being president? <laughs> yes. <laughs> On most, there were lots of things. For example, nearly anybody, if you're a music freak like me, nearly anybody come and perform for you. If you're a movie freak like me and Hillary, nearly anybody come show their movie for you. Uh, and that was great. I mean, we enjoyed that. It was enormous fun bringing the friends of our lifetime. I just told you, I went home to Hope in the little town I was born in a few days ago and appeared at the Chamber of Commerce banquet with two guys I went to kindergarten with. One worked for me and argued a case for the Supreme Court when I was Attorney General. The other, Mike McClarty, was my first Chief of Staff. And we had an hour and a half discussion in front of a picture of us in kindergarten. So, you know, I loved it. I'd have done it forever. I loved having my friends come. But even the hard days were good, not because there were plenty of days that were no fun. But there was never a day, never, when you couldn't make something happen that was good for somebody somewhere if you tried to do it. That was the most important thing. Do you, when you're not president anymore, is that like, you know, you hear about astronauts going to the moon and then they come back and they're like, what? What do I do with this? Well, this is real life. Is it, what is that transition like coming back? To, well, it, the good news was I left, but Hillary didn't. She was a senator. So I felt like I had some... You know, our family was still making some contribution to public life. But the truth is, for two or three weeks, I was never quite sure where I was because no one played a song when I walked in the room anymore. <laughs> I mean, Hail to the Chief was somebody else's theme song now, you know. And, but, and I realized I had to do something else. But I didn't have really any regrets. I, I think it's a waste of time. It's like when a professional athlete ages out. It's a big mistake to spend any time wishing you could do something you can't do anymore. So I just tried to find other ways to be useful. And through my foundation and dealing with disasters, you and I, I, I got to say, uh, Ben Stiller was as helpful to me as anybody in the country in trying to do good things for Haiti after that awful earthquake. He gave millions of dollars to try to help those people start again. And Hillary, Hillary was responsible for the biggest projects, and the State Department helped to fund the infrastructure to get a Korean company that's today employing 16,000 people there. And Ben went to the opening of the industrial park with us. That was great. So I just find things that would, where I thought I could make a difference. Like I think I can do something with this opioid epidemic, so I'm doing what I think I can. Um, I convinced the labor movement to start an infrastructure program where the pension funds of mostly private public sector unions were used to fund projects that provided jobs for private sector unions. And it's still the biggest private infrastructure fund in the country, although there are two proposed that would be bigger. But the labor movement created 100,000 jobs and spent $16.5 billion to build infrastructure and to create jobs in America. I, and that was, came out of one of our Clinton Global Initiative projects. Um, I'm proud of the fact that more than half the people in the world who are alive with AIDS today got their medicine from our project. We negotiated their prices. Um, 
And while we were doing the Clinton Global Initiative, we had an independent audit, independent audit of me that said that the commitments made by people over 11 years had helped more than 400 million people in more than 180 countries. That's as stunning as helpful. I like what we're doing to reduce childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes among young people, to teach uh, our Too Small to Fail program, Chelsea's big passion, getting people to read to their kids and tell them stories and sing to them at an early age. She, one of my, this is my favorite American story. We made a partnership, thanks largely to her, with 7,000 coin-operated laundries. Because you think of how many people without a lot of money wash all their clothes at a coin-operated laundry. We got almost a million books in those 7,000 laundries now where people can take their kids and read, you know. So I tried to be useful, not get in the way, and once in a while, Somebody wants me to be in politics, Hillary, President Obama, somebody else, and do what I, Obama once asked me to be the explainer in chief. <laughs> I don't know if explanation works anymore, but it once did. And so it's been fun. Yeah. Not that he needs any help, but maybe you could give Jared some advice on how to fix the Middle East. <laughs> to fix I, the Middle East? To, yeah. It's a different world now. Yeah. I mean, you might ask Hillary, but I think when Yasser Arafat turned down the peace offer that I got Prime Minister Ahud Barak to take, it was the single most colossal political error in my lifetime with the most devastating human ramifications because they thought, well, God, if he won't take that, he won't take anything. Then it looked like Ariel Sharon was going to be a peacemaker, and he got out of Gaza, and I think we made a mistake forcing him to have an election because that's how Hamas took over Gaza, and they hadn't had an election since. Then he had a stroke. It was almost like God telling us, quit, I don't want peace there. <laughs> I mean, because Sharon could have done it. And now Netanyahu has been there, however long he's been there, 13 years, and uh, when I was president, he was prime minister when we gave the Palestinians the last bit of land they've got to this day in the West Bank. And so the reason nothing's happening now is that he's getting no pushback. The Israeli people are happy. They're secure. They're safe, thanks in no small measure to the Iron Dome that they got when President Obama was in office to protect them from the incoming Hamas missiles. And they're booming economically. And the Palestinians are weak, and the other Arab states are not going to press e e Israel about that because they're more worried about the so-called Shia axis and Iran and northern Syria and Yemen and rural Bahrain. So they're worried about that, and they don't want to mess with it. And whatever Qatar happens to do, so uh, my view is that it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. And what I think will happen, maybe, is that and if you were for the other guys in the election in Israel, you should feel really proud. I think those two generals and Yair Lapid did a good job in that they got almost as many votes as Netanyahu did. But the minor parties have more votes that are pro-settler and pro-Netanyahu than the minor parties who are for the peace process. So we're going to get closer and closer and closer to the day when in the West Bank and Israel proper, there are more Palestinian Arabs than there are Israeli. And when that happens, Israel will have a decision to make. Or maybe they'll do it beforehand. Are they going to be a democracy in which case Jewish voters won't be in a majority, or are they going to be still a Jewish state but no longer a real democracy? But we're going to keep kicking down the can down the road for a while, I think, for reasons that are perfectly understandable and regrettable, but we shouldn't stop wanting Israel to be safe. We shouldn't stop supporting them. We should be glad they get 
half of all the capital investment for cybersecurity in the world every year because we need help with that. Uh, but we should never forget that the other, those people are people too. It's Akra Bean's great genius was to have spent his life defending Israel and to want a different future for Palestine's children. And it cost him his life. We are not at a time now when this can be resolved. So whatever your politics is, just wait, because demographics will eventually bring this to a head again. I'm not sure politics will, unless Netanyahu himself decides, this is my last go around and I want to fix it. He's the only one strong enough to fix it now. You agree with that? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with it. And I, I don't know whether there will be uh, a real peace plan put forward by this administration. If there uh, is to be one, now is the time because uh, Netanyahu has been, uh, you know, reelected. So I'm hoping that there will be a continuing effort. You know, and, and both watching Bill from the memorable uh, moment on the White House lawn for the Oslo Accords, through his efforts at Camp David, uh, which really was disappointing because I agree with him that the Israelis under Ehud Barak went about as far as any Israeli government could in offering uh, a state, and if Arafat had accepted it, there would have been a Palestinian state now for more than 15 years. And then everything that I saw and worked on uh, when I was in the Senate and in the uh, State Department as secretary, you know, this is a really difficult problem. Um, there's no uh, arguing with that. But if the United States retreats from it and doesn't continue to push a process that tries to make some progress, whether it's at you know, Y River, where there were uh, concessions made and, and more land uh, given to the Palestinians, or through the efforts that both the Bush administration and the Obama administration I was part of made, you, you really leave a vacuum, and I think that's dangerous. So, you know, I, I was very much involved as Secretary of State, working with Netanyahu, working uh, to bring about a ceasefire in, a, uh, in the uh, rocket uh, attacks uh, that were going on in November of 2012. Uh, so I feel very strongly about uh, both doing what you can to protect uh, Israel, give it the security it needs, but also recognizing the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people for more uh, self-governance and autonomy. Uh, so let's hope, let's hope, Ben, that there is a legitimate uh, effort made by this administration. They've talked about it, so let's see if they will actually come forth with something. And it is, yeah. Go yeah, that's, I just want to echo what Hillary said. I, I remember once I asked Arafat, I, he was mad at Hood Barack over something. I said, wait a minute, stop. Do you think I care about your children, the Palestinians? He said, oh, yes, much more than the Arabs do. So the, the Palestinians need to know that. But he also knew and admitted that the only reason I could do him any good is that the Israelis also knew I really cared whether they lived or died, that I would never let anything threaten their security. And that I, I think that we have to be very careful when we're talking. We're living in a dream world. If we look at the power balance that's there now and the fact that the Arab states themselves don't care about the Palestinians anymore and are backing Israel with an alliance they think is better economics and way better security against Iran and others, it is very foolish for us to give the Israelis the idea that we are not devoted to them and their security. It's also a mistake. It's, uh, I think it's morally wrong and practically wrong and undermines our ability to influence a change of policy there toward peace. It's, yeah. It's such a complicated issue. It's so complicated when you go there and you see the, all, what's going on in the whole the area and the, the people who are affected and the millions and millions of refugees from, from the wars that are going on in Syria and the Palestinian refugees who are still in Beirut for 70 years. I mean, it's very complicated, and I think the way you lay it out is, is you know, very accurate. Um, so anyway, uh, I can't believe you're watching Blacklist and you know all that. But... Uh, 
All right. I just want to say we're, we're getting to the end here. Um, before we end, I, I, I have to say... Um, by the way, what sh- is it Madam Secretary or Hillary or President Clinton Hillary's, or Bill? Hillary's good. Yeah, Hillary's I great. I should have come up with that earlier. <laughs> Do people have an issue with that when they see you? Do they not know how to address you? Sometimes, but, you know, I, I, I will answer to nearly anything um, since I've been called nearly anything, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, now, um, you know, I've, I've acquired another title, Grandma, and it's a... Um, it's an honorific that I am very, uh, very proud to accept. I remember the first time my granddaughter could say that. I didn't know what she was going to call me. I was trying to think about what I should, you know, ask to be called. Um, but, you know, that, that's what came out, and that's what uh, has stuck. And it's a wholly different experience. So uh, when, you know, we're going to have another grandchild this summer, which is very, very exciting. Um, so when, when you ask Bill, so, you know, what, what's it like no longer being president or in my case, you know, not being senator or secretary of state, every phase of your life is so different and it gives you a whole new perspective on uh, what's possible. And for us now as grandparents, uh, we are seeing the world through the eyes of our granddaughter and grandson. Uh, So the titles are not so important to me uh, as the relationships and the opportunities that I've had over the years to work with some amazing people and to have friends of a lifetime and and now to watch the next generation uh, come to life and and give them every opportunity to be whoever they can be uh, and follow their own dreams. So that's what we think a lot about now. We think a lot about uh, what life will be like for them and our continuing interest in policy and politics and our country and the world is because we we really want to be sure that uh, these two little kids soon to be three um, have every chance to grow up in a peaceful and prosperous and incredibly uh, exciting world filled with potential and you know, that's why we criticize what we see as undermining that, because it is now really personal to us. It's, it's very much about what happens to these little people that, you know, we love so much. And I'd say as the father of a, a daughter... Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say as the father of a, a 17-year-old daughter uh, who I, I watched how she was inspired by you uh, over the course of the, of the campaign... Um, to be uh, a voice and to stand up and what you meant as a woman to her and as a role model. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, You know, I know we got to close, but I want to say something about our grandchildren and our daughter and son-in-law that is relevant to all of you. You know, the first... You'll never hear me say being a grandparent's greater than being a parent. I don't believe that. And I'm very proud of our daughter, and I love my son-in-law, and I'm proud of him. And they have kept us young and forward-looking by bringing a lot of people from their lives into our lives so we don't feel like we're creaky, you know, and losing everything. The great thing about our grandchildren is you can't really be too cynical when you watch children wake up to the world. But we've said a lot tonight back and forth about what we think about politics, and most of you probably more or less agree with us, or you probably wouldn't be here. But uh, I I want you to think about this. It's the middle of things that's all messed up in America, our intermediate of the way we relate to each other, our politics, and all that. But this is the best positioned country in the world for the 21st century. Because of our diversity, because we're relatively young, because of our immigrants, because of our universities, because we respect all kinds of faiths or the decision not to have any and all that. We, we can do things nobody else can do if we get out of our way and start acting with makes sense. So what helps me and I got to give Hillary a lot of credit. From the day after the election, 
she started sleeping through the night. I couldn't do that for more than a year. And I was as worried about my country as I was about my wife. But here's what I find helps me, is when I think of something real big and something real close. So here's the real big thought for this week. Scientists gave us the first picture we ever had of one of the biggest black holes in the universe, right? Now, it is 55 million light years away. There is not a single telescope on Earth that could have photographed it. But 20 people in multiple countries figured out a way to combine the power of our telescopic capacity and catch the picture. Cooperation works better than conflict. For a second, the hole is somewhere between one and six billion times bigger than the sun. And we are told its magnetic power is so great that it could swallow our whole solar system if we happen to float by. And it would turn the earth, the whole big earth, over which we are fighting, our racial, our religious, our political difference, it would turn it all into something that would fit in a thimble. Now, this planet's been here three billion years. People have been walking around a couple hundred thousand. We are among the first in the last couple thousand years, the only people that could ever even decide what they wanted to do for a living. And then there are your children and grandchildren. Think about the big and the little, and you'll make more decisions about the stuff in the middle, like our politics, that makes sense. We have got to stop majoring in the minors and be big again. Not to start being dark, but be light again. We've got to stop this. Good luck. Well, that was safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.